Hello, and welcome to my tutorial on how to build a 5th edition D&D character. Today I'm going to be focusing on building the basic warrior, uh, fighter class. Um, not much to be said about him. They're going to be your frontline fighters or your ranged fighters, but they're going to be kind of a great starter character. Something that you're going to be able to really enjoy any kind of play style. Now I'm gonna go through just the ba I'm gonna go through the basics of starting a level one character. There's probably a million videos out there about this, but now there's gonna be a million and one. So let's get started. So basically, I have the PDF of the uh, actual book right here of the player's handbook. Now there are many books in fifth edition, but the great thing about fifth edition is uh, the player's handbook is pretty much gonna give you everything you need at the very beginning. So we're going to stick to just this one. Now, if later on, if you guys decide you want more content or if you want more on this character and want me to elaborate how I feel about it, I'll make different videos later on about how I can increase the levels or I can increase the levels or go through different avenues and different backgrounds. Many different pieces here. But we're just going to stick to the basic first level character. We're going to do the fighter. So first thing you want to do is you want to choose your race. Now... The two, ba the two best fighter races are going to be your dwarves and your humans, okay? A lot of people have different ideas on different races, and all of them are good fighters. None of them are really terrible fighters. But for the fighter class, the best two are your dwarves and humans, and here's why. Dwarves get a plus two strength, a plus two constitution already. Now, your constitution is going to determine your hit points, so how many hit points you're going to have. And your strength, because if you take Mountain Dwarf, you get a plus two strength. So your two main stats for the fighter is your constitution and your strength. And those two stats from the dwarf get plus two. Humans have the ability to get a plus one on all the stat points here. Or if you take Variant Human, which allows you to get a feat with that human, uh, without uh, if you get a feat as a variant, you only get a plus one on two different stats, which I would choose strength and con, and you get a feat. And if you pick the right feat, you can increase that stat to a plus two, which I'll show you when we look at feats. So today we're going to make the human. Well, we'll make a human real fast. Now, after you pick your race, you're going to look at stat points. Now, point by is the Adventures League and a lot of people's choice because a lot of people don't necessarily roll all that. Um, how can I say this? They kind of might cheat. So DMs opt to do point by just because it's all even keel. And the chart on page, what is that, 13? Will give you the actual basic breakdown of your modifiers and how much points it takes to get to those levels. Okay. So, a good rule, of th the rule of thumb here is how you calculate your modifier is you take your number, you subtract 10 from it, and then divide that number, the remainder, in half. So, if you have an 18 strength, you subtract 10 from 18, gives you 8. Half of 8 is your modifier, and that's where you get the plus 4. So, that way you guys can see all right here. Now, starting level. You cannot get past a 17. You cannot get past a 16 on anything. Okay. So your point by charts are actually right here. You notice your 15 right here is nine points total. So I'm gonna pull up the character sheet, and you're gonna put in eights all down right here, because every class starts with eight stat points. Okay. If you look right here, they all start with eight, so zero cost. Now, with your, with each stat point, you're gonna to want to increase it based off of what you are. We're picked fighter, so we're gonna go melee fighter. So strength is gonna be the highest you can be. So that gives you a nine cost, which is gives you 15. So that's gonna be a 15, and we'll just put right over here nine. Just a nice little notepad. Then, you want your con to be a 15 as well, because 
you're in the front line, so you're going to take a lot. Now, I failed to mention this, which I'm sorry. You have 27 points to spend in your in your each ability, okay? So right now, the 27, we have used 18. Now, since we're going to go basic fighter, which is going to be wearing heavy armor and using prob uh, shield and sword, we're going to go ahead and opt to make his dexterity only a 10. So dexterity. So we're going to add two here. So we're now at 20 points. Okay. So our dexterity is going to be a 10. Now, again, we're making the basic fighter. You're going to take the rest of the seven. Okay. Because you notice you have nine, nine is 18 plus two is 20. So we have seven points left. We're going to put that in our wisdom. Now, a lot of people don't understand why wisdom. They want to put it in charisma or intelligence. This is kind of your choice, okay? But this is where the fun part happens of fighters are going to be the front line. And fighters have the tendency to have low wisdom. So saving against spells tends to be their weak point, okay? Now, in situations where the DM is tired of the fighter basically just dropping everybody in the first hit... Having a higher wisdom helps with that saving throw against those spells. So your character is going to have the ability to stay under your control longer, last longer, and be more hardy. That's why we also gave him a max constitution score. Again, more hit points, more survivability. So now we picked our stats, which basic fighters are easy. We're going to go down to the next chapter where they actually go into the races in depth. And we're going to go to human. Now, humans are the easiest. And we're just going to find the human right down here. And we're going to go by the basic stuff we need. Now, name-wise, I'll let you pick the name. Obviously, I don't need that to do the video. But you have different types of humans. So... A great thing to do in your this will come into play when you do your backstory. So we're gonna hold off on the names right now, but understand that names are broken down by regions and physical attributes can change per region, just like any other human. But for mechanical reason, nothing else changes. Like no human's stronger than another human, no human's more hardy, no human's more intelligent, cunning, charismatic, nothing changes. So all your so we're gonna look at the human traits here. They start with the your ability scores. All of them increase by one. Tells you your age, your alignment, your size, your base speed is 30, and your languages. But we're gonna use the variant rule. The variant rule is we take the ability score increase of all of our stats going up by one, and we're gonna ch pick two different ability scores to increase by one. So we're going to make our strength. A 16, and our constitution is 16. Now that we have those in place, we can now add all of our modifiers to the bottom here. Now, intelligence of an 8 is not special handicapped, okay? You're you're slow learner, so you're going to be able still to function like a normal human being, but you're not going to be the fastest individual, okay? You're going to have a basic intelligence. If you decide to... If you decide to drop this to a 12 and give you a plus 1 instead of a plus 2 and then make that a 10, that's perfectly fine if you want to be just a normal human, an everyday Joe. But I don't care about things like that. I care about mechanics. So we're going to pump that back up to a 14 so our wisdom is a plus 2 and our charisma is going to stay at minus 1. Okay, so you're not going to be able to you're not going to be very charismatic. You're not going to be very intelligent, but you're going to be wise. So you're going to that's going to help you with your saving throws and your survivability out in the wilderness. You're going to have a high constitution, which is going to give you a lot of uh, more hit points to allow you to survive more hits and then strength. So not only can you survive more hits, but you're going to be able to be the, the pillar of athleticism in your party. OK, which we'll talk about as we go down the list. So we did the two in stat points, which are strength and our con. Then we're going to gain a proficiency in one skill of our choice. Now, this is the one that we kind of have to put on the back burner. Okay, we're going to pick one and we're just going to put it in stealth. 
Now, the reason I'm putting it in stealth is because I like to go down by a chapter. Every new player that's going through making a character, I say, put things kind of to the side. And then we're going to go, and then that way you can come back to it, because the chapters are laid out that way. Where 90% of character creation, you go by chapter by chapter by chapter, and you create the character perfectly. You don't miss anything, you don't fall, and nothing falls through the cracks. But, in this scenario, that 10% minor thing, you have to kind of go back and forth. So we're going to leave our skills, our skill proficiency 1 and our feet 1. So we're just going to leave that to the side, okay? And you'll see why. So once we get past all these other races, right? Which I can do a thing on just races alone. Um, we're going to go right down to classes. We're going to skip past all these pages. And we're going to go right to fighter. And if I do believe say so myself, I do believe fighter is the next one. Okay. So fighter. Now, you can read all the stuff you want about fighters, but essentially you're going to be the soldiers. You're going to be the pillar of the athleticism. Pick up any weapon. The best pop culture reference I can give you for a fighter is going to be, um, oh, I forgot his name. It's Val Kilmer's character in Willow is Mad Mardigan. I can't believe that. I probably lost some cool points with some people. But Mad Mardigan. So we're going to name this character, you know what, just so we can do it. We're going to name him Mad Mardigan. Okay? And we're going to do Fighter 1. That tells you level. Race, human. Okay. Now, this is going to be basically all the synopsis for a fighter and stuff like that. But if, if you don't, if you instead of reading on this, you want to do something funner, rent the movie Willow, watch it, watch Val Kilmer's character. That is a fighter. He is Val Kilmer. Mad Martin is the essential fighter. Now, this is going to be the level breakdown of everything a fighter gets. Now, at first level, our proficiency is going to be a plus two. So up here, which is proficiency bonus, we're going to type in a plus two. And then we're going to see fighting style and second win. Okay. So in your character de in your character sheet on the side here, you're going to put fighting style. And we're going to do that. And then we're going to do second win. Now, we'll go over in depth what these are. So your hit points are going to be 1d10. So over here, you're going to put your hit dice. You're going to type in D10. Now, what that does is it's going to allow you to be a D, you're a D10 character. This matters because hit dice matter in the game. Certain skills, certain spells, certain things happen based off of hit dice. And your hit dice is right here. Okay, and what type of hit dice you are can matter in future mechanics. So always have that written on your character sheet because a lot of times people forget. Then your hit points at first level is always going to be your max hit dice plus your constitution modifier at level 1. So our constitution modifier you see is a plus 3. Our hit dice is 10, so we have a total of 13 hit points. Whoops, sorry. Current hit points. We're going to put our maximum points here, okay? Now the reason why is you want to keep your current, your current hit points blank because when you print the character sheet out, you're going to want to be able to write in 13 and erase from it, okay? Or whatever you feel is comfortable. If you want to add up to 13, if you want to subtract down from 13, whichever is easiest for you. But you always want to keep printed on ink or written in ink right here, hitting point maximum, 13. That way it can sustain, like, if you actually erase or something like that. Um, this is not, this is simple in first level. It doesn't really matter because you always know it's your hit dice plus 13, uh, but in cases of, like, if you're in a, character, a game that rolls for hit points, which brings us to our next point, after first level, you want to make sure your hit points are are, cal are written down and scored. Okay, so that 13 written in ink or printed in ink is paramount. Now here, if you do Adventures League or the DMs that do point by system, when you increase your level, your hit points are going to go up based off of half your hit dice plus one, plus your con modifier. It does it for you right here, 1d10 or 6, half of 10 is 5, plus 1 is 6, and your constitution modifier. So every level after first, that's what it's going to be. So that's a lot easier because if when you level this character up, you're going to take half of 10, which is 5, you're going to add 1, and then you're going to add your constitution modifier, which is 3. So you have 5 plus 1 plus 3 equals 9. And if you notice... That 9 is just below your max is 13, but way below, way above your 
minimum of four. One plus three. Because you can roll one on a dice. So by doing average hit dice, if you're given the option, you're technically going to get more in the long run because your lowest number is a five. Your highest number is a 13. And since you're in the nine, you're only four away from your maximum, but you're four away from your minimum. So never mind. You actually, it doesn't matter. That's average. Math. So I just like average hit dice. That way I don't have to worry about what I'm doing. So if they say, hey, roll for your hit points, I ask the DM, hey, can I do can I do average? And they say no, they make you roll. That's fine. But I always take average just because in the long run, you tend to get more hit points. So fighters are easy baby mode. You get all the armor and all shield and shields, period. So every armor you're going to get. Weapons, baby mode. All simple weapons, all martial weapons. Done. Tools are none. Now your saving throws will be strength and constitution. So right here, you put you click on your strength, your con, and you know it's a plus three, plus two. So your strength saving throws is a plus five. Your constitution saving throws are a plus five. Okay? We'll go over saving throws later. But well, I guess we go over it now. Whenever you do a saving throw, it's gonna be based off a of stat point. Okay, so if you're gonna do, if you're wanting to say you want you you ingested some poison, okay, your body's natural constitution is gonna determine whether or not the poison takes hold of you. So you're gonna take your constitution modifier, which is a plus five, and you're going to fight that poison off with a plus five because you're you're already as a fighter, your training and who you are makes your body a uh, athleticism. But also, you your constitution, because as a human, you, you're you're healthier, you have a better chance of fighting it than other fighters who are the same as you are. So that's where the constitution save throw comes in. Now, let's say you're trying to dodge a spell. Like, let's say fireball's casted. Well, that's going to be dexterity-based. Now, as a fighter, again, you're the frontline fighter in the Spartan shield wall, or the Viking shield wall. It's pretty much a shield wall from any dynasty. But what you want to look at here is you're not going to be very dexterous. You're going to be a steadfast and heavy character in the front. So your dexterity is only going to be a zero. So you don't, you're not proficient in dexterity. So when you do a dexterity saving throw, you're unfortunately going to roll with just your percentile dice, not your I mean, with your with your modifier, which is a zero, and no proficiency add to it. That's kind of saving throws. I can sit here and talk to them blue in the face on saving throws, but until you start playing the game, saving throws won't make sense. The DM will just say, give me a wisdom saving throw or a constitution saving throw or a dexterity saving throw. The DM, the dungeon master will always give you that stat point you need, okay? And then skills. This is where we, we kind of bookmarked from previous. We get one from being a, a, a human, and if you look right here, choose two from acrobatics, Animal Handling, Athletics, History, Insight, Intimidation, Perception, and Survival. Now, since since you're stacked up on your strength, your con, and a little bit on your wisdom, a lot of people want to go ahead and they want to look for the skills they're not stacked up on. So they might do History, or they might do Intimidation, because if you look down here, your History is your Intelligence and your, what was it, uh, your Intimidation, excuse me, is charisma. Now you think, oh, I'm going to know history because I studied war in my academy and things like that. Or I'm so strong and intimidating, I should have intimidation. And that's a fine, viable decision. But what I recommend is don't half-ass all, whole-ass one. So I stick to athletics and... I look for perception. Now, the reason why perception in athletics is because athletics, you already have, you already have a good strength. So without it, it's a plus three. But when you add that proficiency bonus, you're now plus five. And here's why this is important. Your party is depending on you to be an easy go-to for athletics checks. Okay, so you come up to a chasm. You got to make a jump to get across the chasm to throw the rope so that the people who aren't athletic can get across. Your brain people, okay, like your wizard, your cleric. These are people who don't really aren't very athletic, so they're depending on you to get across that that chasm or that gap, and that's where you want to make sure your stat 
of athletics is high enough to where it's an easy win. So I always stack that up. And then perception, perception is, do you get sneaked up on? People sneaking on you. So having a plus four really helps. Now here's the best part. Here's what you can choose. The two you get, you can only choose from animal handling, athletics, history, insight, intimidation, survival, perception. Now, based off what campaign you're running, this next one, because you get one for being a, a human, and it can be in anything, you can pick survival. But it all depends on what you're going for. It all depends on what's happening with your character and what campaign. So if you're going to be high city, where you're, let's say you're in Baldur's Gate or Waterdeep, and you're going to stick to just city campaign, let's say it's level 1 through 5, level 1 through 10, level 1 through 20 in a city, survival is not necessarily your best option here. Okay, but if you're going to be a mixture of city, dungeons, caverns, on the ocean, etc., etc., then survival is a good one to have. Also, knowing what your other players are playing is going to have. If there's a ranger in your group, maybe survival is not something important to you. So you take that off. Now, my personal opinion, I always do insight. Okay? The reason why I do insight is that way I know who people are lying to me. Because you're going to have a face of the party. Every campaign is going to have a face of the party. But everybody who's listening to the conversation will be able to hear can roll an insight check. So if, sir, say, for example, someone's talking to you, right? And you're thinking, man, this doesn't sound right. That sounds like they're lying to me. That's insight. Okay? If you're getting a mirage, uh, be an illusion put up to you, that's an insight check. How wise are you to, to their lies, visual or audio? It doesn't matter. With illusions or with the way people are talking, insight's going to do that for you. So always have insight. That's another survivability uh, key piece. Plus survival, you already have a plus two because you're wisdom. All right? So let's go ahead and add all our pluses in here. Our dex is zero. Slide of hand, zero. Religion is minus one. Persuasion is minus one. Performance, minus one. Intelligence for nature, minus one. Wisdom is a plus two. Or medicine, sorry. Investigations, minus one. Intimidation is minus one. History, whoops. History. There you are. Deception. Arcana. Wisdom, whoops, is a plus two. And acrobatics is zero. Okay? So easy. And the games how I play as I play fighters. This is the kind of this is what I like to go with. I like to make sure both sides of my character, their stat points and their skill points are in my are in my favor and how I'm gonna play my character. Mad Mardigan, and if you want when you watch Willow, not if when you watch Willow, you wanna make sure that you look at how Mad Mardigan's played. He tries to talk to people and deceive people all the time, and every single person sees through his ruse. Always. Even when he's dressed as a woman, the dumb fire who was around him sat there and said, oh, this is a woman, this is a woman. And everyone kind of saw him as a woman, but the moment his he showed him their face, because he had his face covered, they immediately knew, that's not a woman. And then all of a sudden, it's a funny scene in the bar. Can't wait for you to see it. But... You know his pers his persuasion is not that high, okay? So that's why I like the minus one in persuasion because that's how I'm gonna play my character. I'm gonna try to lie to people by deception or tell a great story of my deeds, but it's gonna be okay, mediocre at best, okay? So that's why I like the minus ones. Kind of really helps hone in that character. Then you have your fighting style. Now we're gonna be front line, okay? So a lot of people like to use defense. While wearing your armor, you gain plus one bonus to AC. Now, that's something kind of good at the beginning of the game, okay? And statistically, you can look at it as, okay, I'm going to take less damage over a period of time because my AC is higher because they're going to miss me more often. But when a marginal piece of a plus one, and that's a very small percentage that that skill is going to be used, I always recommend dueling. When you're wielding a melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons... And your other, uh, you gain a plus two bonus to damage rolls with that weapon. So we're going to use dueling, okay? So I'm just going to control C, and we're going to go fighting style. 
clean it up a little bit. And we're going to just basically do that. Uh, we got to make sure we clean it up just ever so slightly. And that's that. And if you're going to go great weapon fighting, then great weapon fighter would be your, your best bet. The two I use all the time is going to be dueling and great weapon fighter. Now, you're going to be tempted to use protection. Protection is when you creature you can see attacks a target other than you that's within five feet of you, you can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on attack roll. You must wielding a shield. Now, this is a good feat at first glance, but when you really start breaking down the fighting style, you're going to give up your reaction. Which means if a tactical group, if you're fighting a tactical DM, he's going to do that, entice you to use your protection feature, and then he can run away from you because you have no ability to do an opportunity attack or an attack of opportunity, excuse me, because your reaction is gone. Okay? Always think about things like that. Also, there's a lot of things that have to happen in here. You have to see the person. So if you're blinded, or if it's an invisible creature, you since you say it, can't see it, it doesn't work, and you have to be within five feet. That's three things that have to happen. Seeing, distance, and you have to have a reaction. So you're going to do it once per round, no matter what. So it's not bad. It's not a bad option. But the better one is dueling if you're going to be a fighter because you're doing more damage, which means the the you're going to cause more aggro because as you do more damage, the DM will say, crap, not only is he hard to hit, but he's also damaging me really bad. I got to really focus in on him. That's kind of that threat thing, okay? And your second win. The second win is very simple. Once per every short uh, long rest, you can just heal yourself. 1d10 plus your fighter level. So if you multi-class into another level, it's only your fire levels. So right here, we're going to do this. We're going to control C. And we're going to put our little coal in there. And we're going to do that. Clean it up just a little bit. And voila. 1d10 plus your fighter level. Okay? So that means right now, once a day, Without the cleric, without potions, without bandages, you're going to be able to heal yourself 1d10 plus 1. 1d10 plus your fighter level, which is 1. That is amazing. There's no question whether that's a, If that was something that was an option, that would be the only option you take. That is amazing. Because not only is it great to have at first level, it scales up. Because at level 20, how would you like once a day just to heal yourself because your fortress, your constitution, and your well of stamina, you had 1d10 plus 20. Okay, I've I have characters that high level. I have care. I have a character that's 18th level, and I've played characters level 20, and none of them scoff at a free potential free 21 hit points to 30 hit points. None of them. Okay. So we did. We went through that, and we don't get any of these other pieces. To keep the video short, we're gonna go ahead and skip all this. Okay. And we're going to go down past all these pages, which is just all the other classes. And we're going to go down to Wizards Always, the last class. So we're going to go down to backgrounds. Okay. Your person on your backgrounds. Now, here is a, here is a chart for how to randomize your weight and height and stuff like that. It's all right here. I very rarely see anyone ever do that. So on the second page of character details, we're going to do age, 21, height. We're going to estimate Madden Mardigan was six foot. Okay. His weight, he looked like a 180 pound man. He was slender, but he was athletic. His eyes were brown and skin was tan and his hair was brown. Okay. And we're going to go right there. We have passed all that. Alignments. I could spend a whole video on just alignments, but a great way of great way of making Mad Mart again 
we're going to make him lawful neutral. Lawful neutral individuals act in accordance with the law. No, he's not. I'm sorry. He's chaotic neutral. I apologize. Creatures that follow their whims, holding their personal freedom above all else. Many barbarians and rogues and some bards are chaotic neutral. Now, Mad Mardigan is a chaotic neutral. When you watch the movie, he he really much is on an end for himself. Doesn't care for the law as a man. Okay, he fights for the best ruler and he loves to fight, but he can fight for pretty much anybody he wants to. So, chaotic neutral is a great thing to have for most players. Players who just want to do what their own kind of will is. And again, it's all about role play. I do have characters that are lawful good, and I play them lawful good. But I also have characters that are chaotic neutral and also neutral good. And I play those characters based off that. Now, it doesn't give me an excuse to be chaotic stupid which you'll hear in the gameplay and other gaming videos. And that means I'm just going to do stupid things and blame it on my alignment. I don't do that. I play a character that's not a that's not going to be a backstabbing or a butthole, but a person who's going to play kind of the way he wants to. So if I'm playing a character neutral character and it seems like the fight's going to go the wrong way, it's going to kill me, and I have the option to leave, I'm going to leave. Okay? My character's new self-preservation, which most people will do. So we're going to get past all that up. And this is where languages come in. Now, we get to choose one of our own. So, languages, we're going to go right down here to languages. We're going to type in common. Now, humans get one of their own. I always take dwarven because I love dwarves. There is literally no wrong decision in your languages. Okay? Most DMs will make you pick from the standard one. You pick one of the standard ones, it's pretty self-explanatory. Your exotic ones... Normally times you'll have you'll have a DM say, I'll let you pick an exotic language, but you have to include it in your backstory. That matters. So it all depends on your, your DM and your personal preference. Dwarven, I pick because dwarves are the most prevalent race uh, next to humans that you're going to see in a city dwelling. So my character picked up Dwarven. Okay? And again, it's all about role playing. All right. We're going to go down to backgrounds. Now, your backgrounds are going to be pretty simple. How is your going to be your backstory? Now, we're going to go with Mad Mardigan. Mad Mardigan is a soldier. Now, we're going to go down to soldier. Now, soldiers are going to be your basic, okay? Now, when you look at a soldier, you get your skill, you get your skill proficiencies. As a fighter, we already picked athletics, and your skill proficiency are athletics and intimidation. So, you think, crap, I just wasted a spot, but you don't. When a, when a background overlaps with the class's skill point, you're allowed to take that skill from your class and change it to something else. So, we know we had athletics, we know we had, in, we know we had perception, but the other thing we had was intimidation we also had animal handling so i'm going to pick animal handling okay because animal handling means i'm probably going to be mounted combat on horseback on riding some some sort of mounted combat okay get your chuckles i know i said mounted but mounted combat you're going to need to use your animal handling so we got that plus we get that stinking intimidation here so we got the intimidation. We're going to have a plus one now to intimidation because we have a minus one for our charisma, but we have a plus two proficiency bonus. That means our proficiency now is a plus one. Tools and proficiencies. One type of gaming set and vehicles land. So my guy is going to be, we're going to go over here to the proficiencies and languages. We're going to type in tools. And we're going to say, uh, was it tools and gaming or just uh, one type of gaming set? I apologize. It's actually gaming. So we're going to type in gaming set and we're going to put cards. Why not? Right. So he's going to play cards and vehicles land. So we're going to type in tool. Uh, we're going to type in proficiency dot vehicle land and what that does for me whoop, I spelled vehicle wrong because I'm not smart what that means is whenever you're a whenever you're using a ve a land vehicle 
okay, you're able to allow to add your proficiency bonus, which is a plus two, okay? And the DM can say it might be a dexterity, it might be something else. But no matter what it is, you're going to have a plus two. Now, if it's a proficiency that requires that you have a minus one to your stat point, you're going to have a plus one. But every time you use land vehicles, you're going to add two. Your equipment are pretty self-explanatory. We're just going to control C and control V your equipment right here. Okay. Now, the reason why equipment is pretty self-explanatory. So we're just going to go back here. We're just going to clean this up. And we're going to get rid of the set of bone dice. And we're going to get a deck of cards. Because we chose cards. Okay. And we're going to do equipment insignia of rank. So you go back to you want to go back to your specialty. Right. Or you want to go back to your, your thing. Now here your specialty is you're going to have your feature military rank. Okay. So we're going to control C. Go to our character details. We're going to have right here additional feats and traits and treasure. We're going to put it right here. And we're just going to put feature military rank. Clean this up. We're going to comma. Just going to clean this up. Okay. So that gives me time to talk to you about this. Now, if you're a person of chance and luck, uh, you can roll for your military rank. Okay. Uh, officer, Scout, Infantry, Cavalry, and Healer, all right? Uh, quartermaster, Standard, Bearer, uh, Support Staff, Cook, Blacksmith, or the like. This is kind of your choice. I'm a kind of guy who likes to choose my own destiny. I don't like random fate, but it is does happen because this game is a lot of random fate. The story, the dice are telling a story. So I always pick, I always pick Officer. Now, don't let the dice tell you. If you, on your backstory, want to be part of the infantry or cavalry, be part of the infantry and cavalry, quartermaster, stuff like that. But put in your backstory. How were you in the military? Why are you an officer? Why did you leave there? Um, maybe your platoon died. Maybe you served your purpose. They said you're now able to go live a life of your own. Or you you thought you were lost in combat and you lost your ways. There's many different stories you can go with here with being an officer. Infantry, cavalry, doesn't matter. Maybe your lord died and the new king was like, hey, I don't want you guys around, so just go away. And you're like, okay, now you're out wandering the land. But I always pick officer for me just because I like it. You know, it's just my personal preference. So I'm going to put officer right there, comma. So now the great thing about D&D, especially 5th edition, is my character is pretty much coming to taking shape right now. Okay. I believe Madame Morgan would have been an officer in in the high, in a in a military background. You know, kind of nice. People will know him if you watch when you watch the movie. Uh, he was known for his notoriety and not his positive way of thinking. So when he met Eric the Red, Eric was like, "Oh, you deserve to be in there." So Eric, the general of the army, knew him. And he would only know his officers because generals don't know all their soldiers by name and have a strong opinion about those people. So I'm ascertaining he was an officer. Then suggested characteristics. Now, this is for people who need help in creating a character. I don't scoff them. I never tell my players they can't use them. But I do try to encourage you to come up with your own personality traits, your ideals, your bonds, and your flaws. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, for example, your first night trade, I'm always polite and respectful. I'm haunted by memories of war. I can't get the images of violence out of my head. I've lost many friends. I'm slow to make new ones. These are all very, these are all kind of your own personal way. But 5th edition D&D, &D, the, the, the writer said, hey, let's help you out. Let's put some ideas here. So I'm going to skip that because, you know, quite frankly, that's personal preference. Now, equipment. Your part, your, your DM is going to tell you how he wants you to do it. He or she will want to do your equipment. When it comes to your funds, you're going to get a funds base right here. Okay. Fighters are going to get 5d4 times 10. So that means you're going to get a minimum of 50 gold up to 200 gold. Now, a lot of people think, well, that's a lot of money. 
because the bar gets 200 gold, and the barbarian only gets maximum 80 gold, and I can get a maximum 200, and monks only get 20 gold to 5 gold. But that's kind of why they did it, because a starting equipment cost for your fighter is going to be high. Okay, so based off what your what your DM is going to allow you to do, some DMs go go back to your starting class and get the equipment that starts with the equipment because you're fresh out of the academy or you're knocked off the battlefield and only give the basic equipment, whatever it might be. Um, you can be the one where you just finished the academy, you got 200 gold purse, you went and bought your stuff, and that's what you finished with. Or some DMs might be that meat grinder, hard style gameplay, you start with nothing. So it all depends on that. But just for the point of completion, we'll go right back up here to Fighter. And we're going to go right to the Equipment page. Just CC, Fighter, scroll back down to Equipment. Now, your starting equipment is going to be simple. You pick A or B. Now, it doesn't have to be all A's and all B's. just gives you a nice little ability to do that. So we're going to take Chainmail because we are Frontline Fighters. So we're going to type it over here. We're going to do Chainmail. Oh, and let's do the insignia. Let's go officers insignia. A trophy taken from a fallen enemy. Let's do let's do a broken dagger. Uh in orcs, an orc officers, broken dagger. Okay. So we got chain mail. We're going to put a little comma there. And you can put that, you can put, I always recommend with characters. On a lot of stuff, I want to make sure you, you want to put this stuff kind of organize it up. Like what's in your backpack, what's in your sh what's in your belt, what's on your neck, things like that. Not just magical item spots, but tomb slots. But just kind of where your basic equipment is. Martial weapon or shield. We're gonna go down. We're gonna go look at martial weapons. Uh, just remember that we're looking for martial weapon, and we're gonna put shields. We're gonna put shield. And then we're then going to look at a light crossbow bolts or two hand axes. We're going to type in two hand axes. Now, you might be asking why. Because our dexterity is a zero and our strength is a plus three. Hand axes, when you throw them because they're a thrown weapon, you're allowed to use your strength instead of whoops, two axes. We'll put this. We'll do hand X two. So your bonus is going to be a plus five, which is your proficiency bonus and your strength bonus. And we'll look at the damage we get back down to equipment. And then we're going to take the Explorers pack. Okay. So we're going to put the Explorers pack. We're going to control C. We're going to come right down here to equipment. And we're going to put right here Explorers. Whoop. I guess it didn't copy. Explorers pack. Okay. Now uh, this looks like a jumble mess, but it's coming together. We're gonna go back down to our equipment page. Whoops, went too far. And we're gonna start filling in the gaps. Okay. So chain mail is gonna give you an armor class of sixteen. You need to have 16 strength to use it. You're going to have disadvantage on stealth. And it weighs 55 pounds. Now, you notice here that the medium armor allows you to have dexterity bonuses. But because we're going to be wearing heavy armor, we're going to not have any dexterity bonuses. So we didn't put a dexterity. That's why we don't have a dexterity bonus. There's an argument on that. If you want to use dexterity to have a plus to your dexterity for saving throws, but since you're not getting from armor from it, should you put it on there? It's all personal preference. If you want to have good saving throws for dexterity versus wisdom, but not gain the AC benefit, that's fine. Okay? If you want to have the wisdom saving throw when you need it bonus, and you don't care about your AC because you're heavy armor, that's fine too. 
both sides of that of that argument are correct. So we're gonna we know it's our AC is a 16, and our shield grants you a plus two. Thank you for this for making this easy. So our armor class is an 18. Oh, and by the way, our speed is a 30, and our initiative is dexterity based is a zero. So our bonus initiative is zero. That's what level, that's what uh, order we go into combat, and speed is 30. So you look at a map. Map has squares. Each square is five feet. So every, you can move six squares. It matters. Okay. There's our equipment. Now we get one martial weapon. So we're going to scroll down here to martial weapons. And right here, all martial weapons. Okay. Now my personal favorite is the longsword. Okay. I like longsword. Now, some people like to do... Uh, where is it? There's a long sword there. They like to use battle axes. Okay. It doesn't matter. A long sword and battle axe are exactly the same. One is not better than another. The only difference is that one is three pounds and one is four pounds. Only difference. They're both slashing, which means that's the type of style of damage they do. Uh, some creatures are resistant to immune to slashing damage and some take more from slashing damage. But since both of them are slashing, both of them are D8, both of them cost the same amount of gold. Oh, one's more expensive. Sorry, the battle axe is cheaper. And one weighs more. But they're both versatile, which means if you use it one-handed, you get a 1D8. If you use it as a versatile, which is two-handed, you get a 1D10. But we're not going to be two-handed. Why? Because we took fighting style dueling. So we're going to type in longsword. Okay? If this was a dwarf, I would legitimately... I would just legitimately... Okay. Long sword. There. Our bonus is a plus five. Our damage is a 1d8 plus your strength modifier, right? So it'd be 1d8 plus three. Not so fast, quick shot. Because we took dueling and we're doing a sword and shield, we had a bonus of plus two. So now we have a plus five. Okay. This is where the statistics come in of you'll do more using that feature than the other features, okay? Because what if you're not targeted that round? Almost every round you'll be attacking, but almost not every round you'll be attacked. So that plus one to your AC is not necessarily better than the plus two dueling. It's my opinion. Take it or leave it. So hand axes, which are going to be under your simple, right? Nope, I'm sorry. They are under... Uh, where is the hand axe? And X. Uh, there it is. 1D6. Okay, your range is 20, 60. So right here, I would tie. I would recommend from every player, just to kind of help with how fat. Uh, just to kind of help with stuff. I would just recommend putting that information right here. That way, when you're playing, when you're playing. You're not having to look look up the book of how far range you can do. So at 20 feet, you're going to roll normal 1d20 plus your 5. At 60 feet, up to 60 feet, because your maximum range is 60 feet, anything over 20 but below 60, you're going to roll a disadvantage, which means you roll 2d20s, take the lower of the two numbers. Now, you're kind of wondering why is there plus 5? Because of, sec because of fighting style, du dueling, dueling, I should put a comma there. Thanks for noticing that. When you're wielding a melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons, you gain a plus two, which this is considered a melee weapon. So if your DM says no, that's the DM's choice, but just throw it out there or don't, your choice. But technically, it does work. Okay, You're going to get that same argument in Great Weapon Master, but I'll let you figure that one out or wait for another video when I do that one. So now we're done with equipment, right? Uh, we picked out our token, but now we need to find our Explorer's Pack. So we got our armor, we got our weapon, we got our shield. Now we're going to go down to Explorer's Pack. So right here next to packs, we have the Explorer's Pack. This is where I recommend just copy and paste. Okay? And you notice that I wasn't the only one who thought about indicating where things are. It says right here, the pack also has 50 feet of rope strapped to the side of it. So... Here's what I recommend. We're going to delete Explorer's Pack. Because we know we got that. 
and then I take bat pack, and then I'm going to put a brat. I'm going to put a bed roll. Actually, I'm gonna put the bed roll up here, uh, down by the, the. I'm gonna put the bed roll by the actual uh, rope, and then I'm gonna take this. This is what I recommend as a DM. I recommend to all my players this. I'm gonna parentheses everything the bat pack has is gonna be the parentheses. So my mess kit, my tinder box, my ten torches, my ten days ration, and my water skin are all gonna be in the bat pack. Okay. And then I'm also going to have 50 feet of hemp rope attached rope strapped to the side with bed roll underneath. Okay. Now, your option insignia is going to be on your person. So I would recommend putting that up here by your shield. Okay, so actually, you know what, we'll just do this. We'll cut and paste. Control X, and then we're going to control V. Whoops, I missed the O. That's okay. Put a space. Um, now, what I'm going to do now is, whoops, let's get that all cleaned up. Underneath. Okay, the officer's broken dagger in boot. Okay, the deck of cards is going to go up here. Deck of cards, because again, that's going to be in your bat pack. The common clothes are going to be on you now. If you want to put common clothes, just for completion, I will. Common clothes, comma, officer's insignia, then backpack. What that's going to do for you is, instead of common clothes, and then gold, you're going to put 10, and then and about pouch containing 10 gold. So, and a belt pouch. That gives you an idea where everything's at. So if a, if a character's pickpocketing you, a DM says you're engulfed in flames, your backpack's going to offer a form of protection, okay? And when it comes to encumbrances, how much you can hold, how much you can carry, backpacks help out with that. So just recommend that you put you keep it clean and put everything in a nice, neat spot, all right? There's no there's no no doubt on where you're wearing your common clothes, you're wearing your chainmail, you're wearing your shield, your officer's insignia is going to be on you, your backpack. Uh, you can have your officer's insignia bearing your backpack because you're, you're ashamed of it, but you don't want to throw it out because you felt like you earned it. Um, you can be wearing it loud and proud because just because your lord's dead doesn't mean you don't want to show that you were an officer in his in his army. Whatever it might be, it's totally up to you. But just make sure whatever you decide to do, you have a nice, neat character sheet. Something that you don't have to constantly bog down gameplay by flipping through pages and looking for stuff. Okay? Just helps things out. Uh, that was pretty much it for all of that. And if you want to look at kind of like what all these are, um, they're kind of cool. You can add to them. You got 10 gold. But I recommend keeping the 10 gold. So you're going to scroll down through here. That's all that. Uh, vehicle expenses. This is kind of kind of cool stuff. You know, if you want to buy a horse or anything like that, uh, you can. But right now, unfortunately, since we only have ten gold, uh, war horse is four hundred. Okay. The only thing you can buy right now is a donkey mule, and you don't want to ride that in the, in the battle. So we're gonna scroll past all that, move past all that. Trinkets is kind of cool. You can pick trinkets if you want to, and then that's that. Multi classing won't get into because you're not getting you're not going past level one. But we are gonna go to feats now. I could spend probably two or three videos on every feat you could get. Here's what I recommend. The feats I would recommend. Okay. Depending on what kind of fire you're going to play, whatever you're going to do, dual wielder is definitely one you want to look for. You get a bonus to your AC. You also can use two weapon fighting. Even one hand melee weapons aren't wielding, aren't light. So that means you can wield two long swords, two scimitars, two axes, things like that. If you're going to play a Viking character, I recommend dual wielder, okay? And because you're whipping your blades around, you get a plus one to your AC. You can also draw and stow one-handed weapons when you would normally be able to or draw and stow only one. So this way, when you're 
drawing weapons because you were talking and all of a sudden surprise uh, all of a sudden uh, DM says roll initiative you're like crap I wasn't wielding my weapon you now got to pull it out and you have both of them instead of just only one at a time so dual wielder is definitely something you want to have if you want to go that route but because of who we're playing we're going to look at a feat um, we're going to look at like feat durable durable is going to increase my constitution score by one and max of 20 that's a way that some min maxers will do is they'll decrease this down to like a 15 for example and you know that gives us two more points that gives us more points to increase something else so they might increase their intelligence to a 10 okay and then increase that with the feet up to 16. that's an option that's something really cool and when you roll your hit dice to gain hit points you're gonna get the maximum number so what that means is whenever a whenever a cleric wants to heal you he doesn't roll hit roll the dice to get your hit points back you ch oh no when you roll your hit when you roll your hit dice to get hit points so every day you get to roll uh, between long rest you have short rest your short rest you can use your hit dice to heal yourself instead of rolling them you get maximum that's not bad but the real reason why you get this get that plus one con we didn't do that in this situation so i don't get it now healer is the by far the best feat there is the greatest feat. You don't have any prereqs other than you have to take a feat. No prereqs. You get a healer's kit. Healer's kits are the equipment. They're like a gold, five gold. They're not not expensive whatsoever. You can buy two of them right now if they're five gold. And as an action, you can spend one use of the healer's kit, which they come with ten, and you can you can tend to a creature and restore one d6 plus four hit points. And an additional hit point equal to the creature's maximum number of hit dice. So, what that means, right now, from non-magical ways, you can heal someone with the healer's kit 1d6 plus 4 plus their hit dice. So, the minimum you can heal them for right now is 1, 4, and 1 is 6. If you roll the 1 on the 1d6, you're still getting them 6 hit points. And since your character, who has a lot of hit points, has 13 you get a free half your hit points. So if, this is not from a potion. This is not from spells. This is not a really hard, hard to find item. They're very common. And here's the craziest part. We're going to remember page 156, okay? And we're going to have to remember 156. So we're going to get a healer's kit. And the healer's kit is right, right uh, here. Healer's kit, healer's kit. Oh, it's... Where did you go? Herbalism kit. No. No, it's up here. Healer's kit. I know it's not for a quarter. Healer's kit. It's a kit. is a leather pouch containing bandages, salves, and splints. This kit has ten uses. As an action, you can spend one of the uses of the kit to stabilize your creature and see your hit points without needing to take a wisdom me medicine check. That's it. It's ten. Ten. Here's the best part. We go back to 156. Instead of it doing that, when you use a hit kit to save by this creature, it also regains one hit point. If they're dying and you use it, they get one hit point. So you use a sting, give them one hit point, and use it again because let's say they can't use only once for uh, long rest or short rest. You then increase the healing by one for a dying creature. So character's down. He's zero hit points. You run up, you take out your healer's kit, your pouch, and you bring out lavender, or you bring out a splint and bandages, whatever, wow style, and you go, I'm going to stabilize the character. He gains one hit point. Now I'm going to take another use of my healer's kit, and I'm going to dump into him 1d6 plus 4 plus 1 per hit dice. That hit dice thing, when you're level, say you're level 5, it's 1d6 plus 4 plus 5. So the 4 and 5, the plus 9, is, a, is not a variable. It's constant. This D6 is the only variable. And after, what is that? After second level, the constant is bigger than the variable. How fucking cool is that? So, <coughs> I'm going to get Healer. And also, I use it for my backstory of Mad Mardigan because he gives Laura Dannon, everybody out there in YouTube world or the one person who's watching my video, what does he give her? Da-da-da! Blackroot. 
look at it. It's a great scene in uh, in the waterfall scene. So you can add all this stuff to it, the, the, the flavored text and stuff like that. That's no big deal because, quite frankly, why not have it? It doesn't hurt anything. But I do recommend you keep it clean by not killing the space between these, like keep these bullet points down away from each other just so you can kind of see it and it's easier for you to uh, to read it during battle or during a game session. Um, just nice to have. You don't have to worry about like flip through a book and stuff like that. And it never hurts to have either an intricate knowledge or copy and paste a healer's kit on your character. All right. With that being said, we're going to go back up to 142, if I'm not mistaken. That was the healer's kit. Boom, 142. We're going to go back up here. Look at the healer's kit. And right there, like I said, five gold. So five gold. We're right down here. Inside our backpack, healer kit, and we're going to type in this. This is what I recommend. I would do underscore a couple times, slash two. So if you write two here, you could then make a zero with pencil. Uh, again, it's just kind of nice to have. And then I'd recommend for anybody... Right here in this area, I would highly recommend that you write out in pencil all your players' names because each player you use it on is going to be able to do it once per short rest. And that way the DM knows you're not trying to trick them or something like that. Because I guarantee you, I guarantee you, one of two things happens every time you use that feat. One of two things. Guarantee. 100%. 100% golden guarantee. Either DM knows about the feat and says, oh yeah, you got the best feat there is. Or two, they don't know the feat and they will fight you. They will argue with you. They will get upset about that. And they will make sure you're tracking it. Period. In discussion. You will sit there and say, I copy and pasted the feet on my character details. Here it is. Here's the book. Here's everything. Wizards made the best feet ever available level one for human fighters. Ta-da. Which, consequently, if you're making a human, uh, human cleric, take this feat. If you don't, you'll regret it. So, we're... Getting towards the end here, folks. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go past all of this stuff right here because we don't need to know all these other feats. And we're not going to talk about uh, we're not going to talk about combat and stuff like that because that's not this video. But in the grand scheme of things, you just made your first level character. We made Mad Mart again. I don't care if I spell his name right or wrong. Background. Soldier. Officer. Player name. My name is Chazwiz. Experience points, zero. Again, personality traits, ideals, bonds, flaws, all this stuff is for you. Uh, inspiration, we'll talk about all this other stuff later on. But this character sheet right here, you can drop down right now in any campaign in anywhere in the world, and you're going to be able to play this character. Okay? Um, we can go into later on in life uh, factions, names, things like that, which I have a lot of opinions on. But for now, that's where we're at. Uh, I want to say thank you for everyone who's watched this video, probably my mom and dad and maybe some friends, and uh, hope to see you next time.